before we get started, somebody in the audience told me why quality 2.0, right? So it was a good cue because let me set the context, right? Quality engineering people have been hearing for last 10 years. So this word came after quality assurance when I, I think 2012, 13, right? Quality engineering, uh, like people, earlier it was just about UI and how quality, uh, we measure the quality at the end of the product. But the term quality engineering means putting quality at each level of software development life cycle. So uh, 10 years back, we started talking about the design, uh, how quality engineers can par be part of the design, then code, then it came about performance, security testing. Later on, uh, agile, DevOps added to it, right? And then uh, now uh, that is quality 1.0. Now in last two years, everybody is talking about the new things, about AI, ML, how uh, then quality 2.0 is about more about smart automation, how, how prediction can come in quality, how AI, ML can come into uh, the quality engineering aspects. So this is how 2.0 is shaping up. Of course, there are a lot of things that will come in 2.0, but just to set the context about why we are saying 2.0, and uh, all these gentlemen over here bring in <laughs> the expertise. I'm sure this uh, discussion is going to be um, a detailed discussion, well thought discussions. We'll go deep dive into what 2.0 means, right? Hello. Hi, uh, this is Saurabh Malge. And thank you so much for the True Global team and everyone involved for inviting us and uh, arranging this amazing conference or panel discussion. Uh, I head from headspin.io, so it's an AI engineering platform for user experience evaluations of applications, IoT applications, uh, web-based applications, browsers, and all of those things. Um, today, I'm quite privileged, to be honest, to be here. Uh, we've had a great experience around the whole interactions of uh, quality assurance till the time I have been with Headspin. But uh, since I have started, I have realized for a fact that the importance of automations, importance of AI, and importance of everything that is coming up, uh, especially in Gen AI, uh, I would have had, you know, you know, I wouldn't have imagined to have evolved into so much in this particular arena. Um, uh, my background, I've, I've come from an automotive background, to be honest. I graduated in recently, 20, 2016, 2017, and then I was quite excited about getting into the new space of corporate. I started with automotive, but now I am quite into everything related to automotive, telco, 5G, and also the gaming space, to be honest, especially into the gaming and telco space. Um, I am excited to talk more. I won't take a lot of time just introducing myself. I'll pass on the mic to my colleagues. Thanks, Aurora, for that uh, introduction. So again, uh, just extending upon what Saurav mentioned, uh, really feeling honored and privileged to be here uh, getting this opportunity. So my name is Kapil. Especially for you, you know, there is another Kapil famous in India. So uh, that is famous for the comedy night. So he is actually a comedian, but uh, I'm not the one. So <laughs> I belong to Tracentis. So Tracentis uh, is a leader in the overall uh, enterprise uh, continuous testing platform and space itself. So it's not only about uh, test automation, it's also about test management, it's also about impact analysis, identifying the areas which are important for uh, the enterprises to focus from a testing point of view first, and then extending that entire journey for enterprises to go into the scaling part, which is more into the performance testing area as well. So uh, it's the pretty much the entire uh, bed stack of the, the automation space as well as the management space. Uh, I, I think you, you set up the context very well, you know, that the storm is here, uh, absolutely. And uh, just to give you context, uh, one day back I was in NASCOM, uh, there was a conference there and uh, the 15 panelists and the 15 keynote sessions that happened there, all of them just talked about three things. Cloud engineering, uh, you know, the, the big wave that is coming with Gen AI and the importance of data imbibed with all of this, you know, things in place. And I think it have pretty much uh, a lot of uh, things to do with testing as well. We'll talk about it, you know, maybe uh, as the conversation will go further. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay. I don't think I need an introduction over here, but uh, I'll definitely like to welcome Saurabh and uh, Kapil. They are industry specialists and in their own area. And uh, uh, there are quite a lot of uh, exciting things happening uh, in the quality engineering space. And we'd like to talk about uh, this today and give a different perspective than what we have seen so far. So, yeah, that's it. I'm Rahul. I hope you guys know me. <laughs> I am the common denominator uh, for all these discussions. I mean, uh, Selvo, we were discussing on Genetive AI and also over lunch. 
um, I had analytics and AI and uh, it is super exciting time to be in, especially uh, not only with the pace of change in the technology space, but also the pace of adoption. I mean, I joined True Global uh, quite recently and we have built generative AI solution in a record time. Uh, in the past, it would have taken a lot of time. So, times are changing and we are also able to adopt quite fast. And that's the exciting space to be in. So, Kabil, what are the latest things happening in, in the industry to optimize and accelerate end-to-end -end test automation? Thanks for that question. You know, first of all, it's good that you talked about end-to-end -end, uh, in the question itself because uh, I think that is where the, the key uh, direction starts, you know, because earlier the testing was more focused in uh, uh, the web-based automation or talking about, you know, very siloed species of API and mobility as well. But when we look at enterprises specifically who are uh, embarking on the journey of transformation and, uh, you know, who are willing to embrace the DevOps uh, persona altogether, right, it's, it's still they are a dream for a lot of companies. Uh, testing have always been a bottleneck in that journey altogether. And the, the major bottleneck was the, the entire landscape is so heterogeneous because there are so many internal applications that are uh, on the shelf uh, in-house developed. There are so many applications that are packaged applications available in, uh, in the market for them. And then the overall integrated environment that they have in place uh, is crucial from a testing perspective. So enterprises cannot just focus on uh, testing bits and parts of it. So we need something that is called as platform effect a tool that is having the capability or a platform that is having the capability to touch on all of these areas which are not just uh, around web and mobility. So we have to have the possibility to deal with desktop-based applications. We need to have the possibility to deal with the microservices from the cloud native perspective. And uh, since most and most uh, the customers are going towards AML as well now, pretty much we'll be hearing the demand from our customers. I think you'll be the first one to ask about it how we can really test the AI part of it, the algorithm part of it, and how can we also embrace towards the functional part of it. So that is something which is uh, the new trend in the industry. Uh, one thing that we have been really investing uh, internally as a, uh, you know, research as well. So we started thinking about the overall uh, computer vision part uh, quite early on. So we already had the capabilities in the tool which are able to interact with the applications in a way a human visualizes the, interact, uh, the, the application as well, right? Because that helps the overall automation to go one level behind. And we have seen our customers taking to the level wherein uh, the developers are in a meeting room and they are just deciding on the design on a whiteboard. They're just taking a photograph of it. They're just feeding it into the vision AI computer or vision algorithm. And the, the solution itself is generating the test cases out of it. So we can imagine the shift that we have achieved here in terms of uh, taking the testing from an afterthought we thought when developers are just trying to design the overall ideation of the design itself, right? So that is where I think uh, the industry is embracing. Uh, another thing is, is around, uh, which I believe sometimes is not, you know, talked about very heavily is uh, service virtualization. So why I'm bringing service virtualization as a concept here is because uh, the more we are talking about uh, going integrated and, and uh, heterogeneous, we are talking about a lot of applications that are external to us, right? So we are required to have payment gateways, we are required to have interfaces which are more on the map side. Uh, we have the interfaces which are actually facilitating the, uh, the design as well. So for us to have uh, the entire automation in place, specifically when we are talking about the integration testing, if these application areas are not responding, these services are not available, your testing stops then and there only. So there is a need of having uh, the entire automation journey integrated with the service virtualization thought as well, so that uh, the entire SIT and UAT phase can continue irrespective of the dependencies that are there on the third party systems. So these are some of the areas. I'll touch upon Gen AI and AML uh, a bit later because I think that is something which should be, uh, you know, slowly building upon. Uh, I don't want to start with, the, with that thought itself, but uh, the entire DevOps part is also something which is uh, very, very critical. So data and end-to-end -end, uh, automation from a platform perspective, uh, embracing that with the, the service virtualization thought is something which is very critical. That is, that is what we believe, you know, being part in that space from last 20 years. Yeah. Okay, thank, you. thank you. So similarly, what are the trends in digital experience? How that can be optimized? How, how testing can play an important role in the digital experience? Okay, that's actually an interesting question. Uh, I was actually talking to Kapil and Sir previously to this, uh, you know, in, inside the meeting room. I'm actually a huge chess fan in that case. And I was just watching uh, yesterday's match of my Magnus Carlsen versus Pragna and I guess you m all must have been watching along with the Chandrayaan that was happening yesterday. Right? Uh, the thing with chess is that 
it has been a huge huge game it has been in place for a huge i mean long long time in in, in this piece right it shifted from being on the board to online very quickly once everything tech began right and in that case also uh, there came a lot of need of testing and not just testing but in that case streaming possibility and availability of a certain game availability of the, its infrastructure as well right i am talking around omni channel experience of everything that is happening digital right it could be iot it could be mobile applications it could be web based applications and it could be also you know uh, thick applications which are only operated on your mobile uh, web browsers or your laptops or your you know uh, laptops or your computer phones right mobile phones uh, so when it comes to not just chess it comes to a lot of tier 3 audience which are coming into picture the next billion users that we talk about right it could be india it could be africa it could be you know middle east as well right uh, these three areas are might might not have been tapped enough but they are evolving in that case right and i'm not sure if it, the tier 3 india has evolved much but the whole world is looking towards these next billion users who are taking up these new infrastructures and then evolving in this architecture the second thing that i would love to touch upon after omni channel experience it would be around not just testing functionally for a certain application but it involves a lot of performance analysis as well right functional testing usually involves you know testing of a certain uh, case if, if it's pa passing or failing or not right it could be more than that with automation right when it comes to functional analysis you are talking about integration with your ci cd pipelines you are talking about integration with or rather predicting your testing cases failing of your testing cases before in, even the cases arise right it could be a lot of into uh, you know user experience evaluation of testing the entire user journey of a certain application or a certain game as well right so uh, omni channel experience and uh, you know performance analysis and the third one would be again when we talk about gen ai and just ai integration of different platforms inside your existing platforms and testing of these integrations is a, is a huge untapped you know idea to be honest uh, which is developing these days right um, these are some of the few activities this i feel are a bit trending one more anecdote anecdote which i would personally would want to point out here is that when i was watching magnus carlsen yesterday uh, magnus carlsen kind of declined from getting into uh, you know big matches or rather he is not going to defend his world champion you know championship any any more right uh, there's a new world champion is ding derain from china right now he is not the world champion anymore but the thing is he is shifting from chess to poker right he is not really stopping with himself you know by 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 just evolving into chess or rather playing more this guy is a pioneer right nobody can achieve the maybe nobody can achieve the way that he has evolved in this game but the way that he is shifting his audience from chess to poker is a revolutionary to be honest and and the new users new experience that he is bringing to the table not just him but a lot of other influences a lot of other ideas that are being brought upon when it comes to live streaming of games when it comes to live streaming of these new age games that are being you know brought upon i think that's a new new trend that will be seeing in in near future not just near future but in few years as well we talked about end to end automation we talked about digital experience so rajiv when rajiv is heading our automation coe he talks about intelligent automation right so what what exactly intelligent automation covers Uh, so i think uh, internet automation is a uh, very interesting and uh, evolving concept as such so it covers the uh, ci cd it covers the functional performance uh, it brings in the uh, managing of underlying infrastructure brings in managing of the underlying test data making sure that we are when we are getting into some kind of a quality measurements the underlying set is uh, proper the baseline is set and we are Uh, gathering intelligence as we are executing those tests as we are uh, you know uh, capturing the information and providing certain degree of prediction about quality it's not just about measuring the uh, we are talking about quality engineering 2.0 right engineering 1.0 was more on the measuring the quality now we are looking at predicting the quality and that's where the intelligence uh, comes into picture and there are quite a lot uh, scope for aml in these areas Uh, if we are able to predict the sensitive areas uh, where the now we have released one particular uh, product in the market or uh, and then we have a history of last uh, five releases we can actually predict in which area the defects are more likely to happen 
it can be mapped to uh, technology, it can be mapped to individual developer, or it can be mapped to uh, some degree of integration, or maybe third party. So, I mean, we can actually, we, that's where we are heading. We should be able to predict quality beforehand. Yes, and that's, that's the intelligence uh, that I think that comes into the intelligent automation phase. Sure, sure. So, Rajiv brought a very fair point because, Rajiv, you, uh, it felt like that you were talking about our product roadmap. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, uh, I think you brought a very fair point that uh, when we are having the automation journeys happening over time, release by release, regression by regression, we are having uh, a lot of data, which is the test data, not only the synthetic one, but the dynamic data as well, part of the automation. We are having the entire testing, test suite inside the tool itself or, you know, as, as a testing portfolio. And then the executions that we are continuously doing, that is enormous data. As of now, the mindset have not been, you know, and there was technology constraints because uh, to really think of predicting something, you need to have some possibility from a technology perspective as well. Uh, because you cannot just predict the next steps based on the historical data. You need to have the current parameters in place as well. For example, when my next regression is going to get executed, what are my environment parameters? What are my data parameters? What are my other parameters that can influence my execution? And with the combination of historical data plus the combination of these parameters, the prediction is possible. So it's pretty much something which most of the automation companies are looking into as well. It's a work in progress. It's not the uh, it's not it's not reached there where we want it to be, but uh, definitely some initial groundwork have started happening in there. And the possibilities from technology are really uh, giving us you know quite good amount of hope in that direction. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Rajiv. So taking a cue from. Yeah. You both mentioned about data, data, right? Let me introduce Rahul, who is heading our analytics and AI practice. So Rahul, what this data, everybody talks of data, right? So how it is uh, making an impact on quality or prediction of, uh, how it is playing a role in testing as such? Good question, Anant. And in continuation with uh, what you also said, Kapil and Sagar and Saurabh and Rajiv, uh, as I said, data is the common denominator. now. To your point, uh, Kapil, maybe you should try GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, which can also generate the test data during the life cycle. And when we talk about predicting the, it's not about just predicting the quality. Yes, we are seeing it from the lens of quality engineering 2.0, but then the larger goal of any enterprise, be it a true global or be it games global is to achieve the deadline. That's the common goal. Can we predict based on the second sprint itself that we are going to miss it? Based on the test data that we can generate, based on adversarial networks, based on the environment parameters, based on the skill quality of the testers, skill quality of the developers, so that we have an overall predictability. And then we work backwards so that we ensure that the deadline is missed. It is not a mission impossible. <laughs> All right. Thanks. So, a lot of customers are talking about setting up digital testing labs, right, and uh, Headspin is one of the experts in that, right. So, how digital testing labs are helping customers? And if you want to walk us through any case studies, or that will be really nice. Fantastic. Uh, test labs and 5G test lab, there are two things that are really happening these days. One of it is in just telcos which are establishing their own test labs and putting up different infrastructure for their own startups, for their own infrastructure as well and for the startups which are evolving into their own 5G labs as well. Right? Uh, I'll bring up on one case that we are interacting with recently. Uh, T-Mobile has set up a 5G lab in US, uh, some of their own infrastructure in US. We are a part of this lab as a part of testing their own startups, incubator startups which are a part of these infrastructure which are using 5G test labs inside T-Mobile and developing different types of games on their own platforms, right? For example, uh, games which are related to just AR, VR space, games which are related to just the AI space, games which are related to interactive space, are developing different types of games using T-Mobile infrastructure. And then they are testing these games uh, rather in before the development phase, during the development phase, or after the development phase as well, so that they can predict different types of, uh, you know, issues that may occur into their platform, right? And while they test, they're using Headspin platform to test these different types of games on our different types of infrastructure. It could be mobile applications, it could be you know, web-based applications, it could be browsers as well, right? So this is one of the case that I would, usual, I would usually point out, but this is a happening phase uh, that is happening in US. 
Uh, but when it comes to test lab, there are three things that are usually taken care of, right? It could be a cloud, cloud infrastructure which is very prominent, right? You, you'll be able to get handhold or, you know, get the infrastructure right in front of you, which is provided by our platform. You know, the P-boxes which we established to deploy different types of mobile phones, different types of, you know, web browsers on those particular platforms so that they'll be able to test inside their labs. Secondly, a lot of security is provided, right? You need not to store the data or store the logs which, are, which you are gathering ac across all these tests and then store them all of an into a certain um, test, test center or other air gap deployment wherein you don't have to deploy these particular on a cloud infrastructure. You just have to put it inside your uh, infrastructure provided and then access it whenever you require. Right? And the third thing which is usually talk talked about is a lot of security in terms of you know, the whole infrastructure appointment. Right? It could be the whole temperature control environment. It could be the whole you know, interactive control environment wherein the whole other teams of these particular organizations are coming together and taking tests on these platforms that we are providing, right? So, uh, I've, I've usually talked about, you know, uh, testing into 5G labs because on-prem is, is a happening thing again when we talk about infrastructure deployment, right? It could be cloud, it could be shared model. Shared model are usually predicted to be not so, you know, uh, you know secure in that case. but when it comes to security, all of us, even True Global and everybody else, are prominent about providing security to their customers. But when it comes to on-prem deployment, that's the prominent factor of security and that we kind of have evolved into just not just gaming, not just telco, but also BFSI sector, right? Banking and finance have usually been asking us for you know, on-prem deployment setups, which are either in their test labs or in their own data centers, right? And, and in that case, uh, not just BFSI and then a lot of other startups which are approaching us for t establishing their own setup labs, we are you know, at the forefront of establishing it that for them. So that's kind of into how we talk about you know infrastructure build up or rather test labs for these particular startups or yeah. customers. So any scale, what scale kind of a lab you have set up or you uh, can share any case study or use case? Yeah, so uh, when I talked about P-Box infrastructure that we provide, one P-Box occupies 24 devices. It could be iPhones, it could be you know Android phones. And then uh, T-Mobile has set up around more than five P-Boxes, which is 24 into five different devices which are set up inside their labs. And these are startups which are coming into their infrastructure, in, into their labs. Uh, these are basically incubators, right? These people are participating in different hackathons and developing different types of games, right? It could be AR, VR games. And taking one, one or the other different uh, P-boxes which are available inside their labs and testing their platforms on these labs, right? The use cases is, is usually around testing of the entire user journey a certain gamer or a certain user goes through. And then creating, you know, taking different types of issue cards which are occurring on these particular games. It could be related to the whole HTTP level, the whole CDN level issues that are occurring, or even low page content and you know loading infrastructure. For example, loading page, how a certain page is taking time to load, or rather, how many, uh, how is the game reacting to the certain T-Mobile infrastructure 5G provided, right? So when it comes to test labs, you'll be able to you know, real-time test how your devices and how your games are reacting to your own network infrastructure in that case, right? So, some of the use cases, some of the examples that I usually point out. Good. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. So, uh, Rajiv, uh, like we are talking about quality engineering yeah. 2.0, right? So, you might have created a lot of test strategies earlier. Yes, right? yes. So, how this test strategy creation is changed now? Sure, sure. We can, uh, I'll, I'll, that's a very all-encompassing uh, question. So, I'll give you a different example. I mean, this is something which Sagar, myself, and we were discussing yesterday for our automation platform. So, we are enhancing our report engine, right? And we were designing how the report engine will look like. So, uh, the question was, shall we just support the automation? Shall we just generate report and dashboard for automation? I said, no. We need to support performance as well as a part of that. We need to have end-to-end -end monitoring. Okay, will that be sufficient? No. We need to have chaos engineering into it as well. Okay, will that be sufficient? No. We need to have uh, dashboard for RPA also. We need to see the trend of uh, the bots which are getting executed, and we need to see uh, the how those are bots are performing. So, will that be sufficient? Maybe not. We might be testing AIML models down the line. 
So we need to have a reporting mechanism which can uh, give the performance or accuracy or confusion matrix or various metrics that we measure. Uh, so we need to build a reporting engine which can take care of all these aspects. And now with JNA coming into picture, how do we even test that, right? So, uh, so that's the final end game, uh, how the reports and dashboard will look like. So uh, when we talk about strategies, uh, it's, it is, uh, it's, earlier it was more on the unidimensional uh, feature or functional uh, testing, but now it's more on not just the functional, it's start from the uh, environment, how the environment will be provisioned, what kind of data that we need, what kind of, uh, can we provision the environment dynamically, uh, how early can we capture the underlying quality, uh, the shift left approach that we uh, now Almost everybody is aware of the same. Uh, at what all levels we can test at API, UI. Uh, I'll, I used to give this example. So in one of uh, earlier engagement, we used to have uh, you know three streams working, and there were five different environments. So each any code push on one stream, they used to validate at uh, API and uh, UI level. It's completely DevOps CI/CD pipeline. So the push when it goes to next environment, integrated dev. We used to validate not just UI API for them, uh, individual stream, but the integrated validation. Then there was a SID, then there was a pre-prod. So at every uh, code push, we used to cover uh, UI API performance. And now with chaos coming into picture, now with the uh, data generation is also one of the key aspect of uh, building QA strategies. Uh, many a times we have seen uh, there are tests might fail, but it is not because of the application. It might be either because of the baseline data or the data which is fed into the uh, respective test, right? So how do we manage those strategies? How we can ensure one very interesting use case uh, we are discussing with, uh, you know, Weber and team, right? So there is one very interesting use case. Uh, they want, they, they have thousand plus test cases and they want to execute uh, only specific tests which are relevant for that code push. So how do we manage that through AIML? So uh, that is one of the strategy that we can bring in. Uh, so there are quite a lot things uh, can be done, especially AIML coming into picture. We can uh, use leverage AIML capabilities to answer all of these que uh, questions. We can bring in the uh, underlying intelligent automation associated with it as well. Thanks, thanks Rajiv. Test data is very critical. All customers want data integrity to be maintained, confidentiality to be maintained, intellectual property, right? So what organization should adapt as a strategy for test data management? Yeah, good question, uh, Anant. And um, in the context of the roadmap that Kapil, you talked about, or the way uh, you have designed automation platform, I think, um, the evolution is coming up wherein I think till last year the focus was more on how we can generate more test data. Uh, we do have our in-house test data generator for you know catering to various testing scenarios so that the code gets tested etc. But uh, enterprises are evolving faster and how AI ML can be at the center of doing this test data generation how we can build more extreme cases, which is more likely to happen in the production setup. And having a, a push into test data generation using leveraging artificial intelligence, leveraging machine learning, but not just for the sake of it, being it, making it more real, more real in the, um, in the real world. So how a human being is going to interact with the, with the system and when the breakage happens, then what? can we test those situations? So having test data generated to that extent is what the future looks like according to me. Okay, thanks. Can you walk us through any use case or any example in media or gaming industry where you have done real, real extensive automation? Yeah. So uh, good, you know, that you're talking about use case. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, before going to the use case, I'll try to extend upon what uh, Rajiv was pointing to, uh, because I think uh, for any enterprise or for any, you know, uh, domain to have automation success being achieved, uh, tools are not enough. You know, I think uh, you already pointed about the mindset and adoption from the practitioner perspective as well. 
and the overall methodology of uh, you know, ruling out that tool is also very important. You, I think you brought very fair sequencing in that, uh, you know, that first of all, before even going to the automation stage, are we having the right uh, test uh, cases to really test as well, right? Because we don't, just, uh, don't want to just focus on number of test cases passed or failed because that was an incorrect matrix previously because it never gave us an indication that am I covered from a risk perspective or not. I might be automating thousands and thousands of test cases, everything is green, but at the end when we go back to the, the team and say can we release the application, they will have their own doubts because the entire methodology in terms of uh, starting with the risk analysis in place was not there and uh, I think you were pointing a, a a thought there which is called as impact analysis. So we have a tool called Live Compare which is more into uh, uh, identifying the changes that him, uh, that happen at the code level when uh, the, the, the entire application is moving from one stack to another stack and then it actually tries to map it into a heat map identifying what are those business critical areas which are impacted the most and what are those areas which you should be testing first. So that you know we can start our testing from that starting point with having the right impact in place and have those many uh, kind of test cases created so that when we execute them, they might be a subset of the bigger test portfolio that we're talking about. But when we have executed them now with 80-20 rule in place, we'll be having more confidence that our risk is more covered. I'm more confident in releasing that product now. I'm more confident in uh, making sure that it'll have lesser pro uh, defects when it'll go into the, the main release cycle. So that is uh, very important. So it starts with impact analysis. It moves to end-to-end -end automation uh, from intelligent automation perspective combined with security testing as well because without security testing, uh, you know, Saur was also mentioning about it, we cannot move the testing forward and then it can be further scaled to the performance testing, right, which you were talking about as well. But there also there is a bit of innovation happening. Can our functional scenarios be converted automatically into a non-functional test? It is there. We are doing it today for our customers. Any functional test case which you are writing in a tool today, Tosca, that can be converted into a non-functional test case with clicks. That means your journey is continuing. So you are able to now scale the automation journey as well. So the entire methodology is slowly building up. And then comes the data part of it. So data have test data management. But then data is also the, the huge amount of data that is getting captured. For example, in the gaming industry, we might be having a lot of user data with us the user behavior that is happening every day, the kind of reaction that the user is reporting on every uh, instance of interaction with the game. Now this data is in the, in the move. So it might be in the form of a file in the beginning. Uh, it can be a CSV file, XML file, JSON file getting generated from our system. But now it might be moving to a database instance, which might be a Linux based database instance. From there it might go to a data warehouse. From data warehouse stage it might have some transformation logic in place and then that data might be getting converted into some reporting platforms like uh, our you know, uh, Power BI and Tableau dashboards. Now how to validate the, the entire journey of data? So uh, the data testing should start from left to right because if you are not testing the data right from the source stage itself, the, the possibility of you know, uh, having the defects detected at the later stage will be more costly affair. So data validation at every stage is also very important and we have a solution around it called data integrity and it is something which is getting used by our customers. Why I am talking about all of this is because uh, one of our biggest customer in Hong Kong is Hong Kong Jockey Club. They are into the gaming domain and they have been using uh, our service virtualization product. They have been using our automation product and they have been using our performance testing product from last four years. So they have been able to scale the automation to a stage where their entire iOS platform testing is happening in a seamless manner. So any new release and build that they're deploying, it is actually getting triggered from their platform. They have head spin in place. The entire automation is done inside the tool and the entire automation is triggered on in scale on the platform. The entire reporting happens back to the automation suite, back to the, the trigger suite, which might be a Jenkins Azure DevOps. And there is a single source of truth available for all the stakeholders who are part of the journey. It becomes easy for the ones who are a part of that automation journey to have uh, the real uh, significant outcome data shared with the stakeholders because at the end business wants to know uh, with this release, were we able to really achieve our objective of releasing the application within that uh, short span of cycle as well as how many defects we were really able to address. Uh, were they really the defects or were they really the environment issues, right? And were we also able to achieve the quality that we were supposed to have? So we had this very good success story and this customer is referenceable. So we can have a discussion in place if required. We have another customer called Macau Sense who is also in the similar domain and they have also been in this journey from last one year now and they're slowly and progressively going 
going the stage where they are maturing. Because I'll tell you one problem that happens is that uh, enterprises have n number of tools in every tool that they have been using till now. When it comes to adopting a new tool, it takes a mindset change as well. And then you start seeing internal resistance from the technical teams because they might have an affection for a specific tool. They might have you know, an inclination towards a technology that they have built homegrown. But when it comes to the real business outcome of it, and we want to go for a long-term benefit and long-term adoption, that is where the mindset have to be also slowly changed. So how we have been doing it with our customers is that we have been asking them to identify their super complicated and complex use cases. Let us bring them on the table. Let us do a joint analysis in terms of automating it and you know, evaluating them from the tool of your choice and the tool that you want to really embrace as well. Let us have the real KPIs and matrices in place. And then let us take the decision on the basis of data because it's not only about the business to adopt it, it's also about the, the people who would also be able to progress in their career as well. Because it might open a lot of avenues for them from a, from a career progression point of view. So these are some of the case studies that uh, we have been really you know, seeing from a gaming point of view. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kapil. All right. So let's move to the last segment uh, about everybody wants to hear about AIML, right? Nowadays, that's the buzzword, right? Everybody is talking about it, right? So my first question to Rajiv, right? What do you think in next two to three years is going to disrupt in automation? So uh, next two to three years, things, uh, the way I look at it is going to be completely different. I mean, the conventional automation is going to be... Uh, I can say uh, out of the picture altogether. Uh, it is going to be more on the AIML uh, based automation. It's uh, as he was talking from the design stage itself, how we can capture uh, at least have a certain structure available. And as the applications are evolving, how that get fades into automation. Uh, I'll give you another example. And this was uh, one of my earlier organization 2009 timeframe. Uh, there also we have built a similar uh, platform or uh, automation framework and they were, they were using a specific technology it was uh, it has a specific rendering mechanism and we used to parse the code as a part of uh, deployment or other uh, code building process we used to get the underlying uh, elements and of course there are certain defined scripts but those elements get used to get feed into that particular script and we have at that point of time we have used Ruby on Rails and things like that. I think even the application development itself is going to change. Uh, it is going to be quite a lot. Uh, code generation is going to be focused rather than code writing. So that way automation also will be focusing on code generation, the uh, intelligent flows, uh, even during execution making sure that uh, the focus execution uh, is also going to be uh, into picture. So it's not, and again, it's not just about the, the functional aspect. The non-functional aspect will also come into picture. As the tests are getting exe uh, executed, there will be, uh, you know, we are, will measure the performance, will un measure the underlying uh, security loopholes. Uh, again, across the multiple devices, across the multiple uh, interfaces, all those uh, things can be uh, I think that's that's where the AML is going to come into picture, and of course, on top of it is uh, the way I look at it is uh, it is going to will slowly evolve into intelligent automation platforms, or uh, that will provide the insight from uh, top uh, level as well as from bottom level at various degrees. Uh, we can see uh, how the overall application is performing, and overall quality quotient can be uh, measured dynamically. I think that's that's where we are heading. Just a small point I would like to add. Thank you so much for Rajiv, this whole explanation. Uh, when it comes to Gen AI and the new AI ML models that are coming up, there's a huge factor of empathy that we haven't really touched upon. You had brought upon the EQ factor here, which kind of aligns with the empathy part of everything that is happening with AI, right? I'll give you an example. My nephew plays uh, mobile or rather desktop games until 5 a.m. in the morning, right? That is. I mean, that's a sad part. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but it's amazing. I'm so amazing that he's so small. And I, I don't know what I was doing when I was 12 years old. But he's playing these games along with that. He's creating some videos out of these games, small snippets out of these games and putting them on YouTube. Right? So your gaming consumers are not just users or are not just consumers or are not just consuming these games. They are your prominent, you know, uh, users in that case. They are not just users, they are the user of your platform 
overall, right? They are consumers plus they are generating revenue out of your games, right? So for example, I'm playing a certain game, my nephew is playing a certain game, he, he observes for a fact that he went through a great user journey, he played a great game, he records that game, he puts it on YouTube and then he gains some views or rather he makes the YouTube, you know, monetized at the end of the day, right? So there comes a lot of factors of integrations with a lot of external parties, external softwares, external existing parties which are prominently used across these users. Now this nephew, he does not live in a tier, tier 1 city, right? He is in from tier 3 city, right? He barely knows about how to handle a desktop but he knows very well to play a game, right? He knows very well to play, create videos out of these particular games and put it on YouTube, right? So when it comes to empathy, these Gen AI models play a huge factor here. Right. They should be aware of the fact that your users are not just one tier 3, tier 1 users. Your users are users who are using it at a village level or a small city level uh, you know, infrastructure. And then they are playing, not just playing but creating revenue, their own revenues out of this. So API testing, integration testing and third party integration testing and also subscription testing with these different softwares. This guy maybe does not have money, he uses his you know, uh, dad's credit card to subscribe to these games but he knows how to subscribe to these games. So, empathy plus, you know, testing of these entire infrastructure is a huge factor here, should be taken care of. Yeah, good point. Yeah. All right. So, next, Rahul, everybody is talking about generative AI, right? And a uh, lot of organizations want to do that and they want to embark the journey of AI ML, right? So, what do you suggest where organizations should invest? from an AI ML perspective? Yeah, uh, one disclaimer I would like to add before I start. I think um, every solution um, or every new technology should not be searching for a problem. It should not be, I mean earlier I was leading a blockchain team and uh, now it is generative AI and artificial intelligence and ML. But it should not be that we are building a solution and then start searching for a problem the problem has to be solved and for enterprises it is important because we have been having conversations uh, with multiple companies where we are showcasing our generative AI uh, solution but the use cases have to be right and then we should break it down. Now generative AI has few core components, very few. It's not hugely complex that AI was earlier when we used to start working on CNN or RNN it was a nightmare to take like three or four months just to basic training of the models, get the right epochs and even the, uh, the infrastructure used to cost a bomb. Right now we are getting pre-trained transformers and that is the killer and even Facebook has open sourced Llama 2 on which we have built our uh, generative AI which we demonstrated you today. And there are others as well like Tapas, Tapex and uh, um, there is also uh, Falcon is there. And they give some t-shirt sizing. You know, we are ready with 2 billion parameters, this is the one. If you want uh, pre-trained on 7 billion parameters, this is the model. If you want pre-trained on 35 billion parameter, this is the model. I see a shift where as a consumer, as an enterprise, I get that flexibility that I can choose maybe across the models as well. Not just stick to one model. So the stickiness is not there. And that's where uh, an enterprise like True Global has a massive opportunity. That it is not that enterprises need to go to open AI, for example. We can do the configuration for you and that's the 333 model that in three days we can deploy and configure the as-is model that we have. In three weeks we'll train the prompts, that is the prompt engineering, so that the right questions are asked and the model gets subtly trained, the large language model. And three months if you want us to tweak the existing large language model so that we train the weights and stuff like that, which will take time. Okay. Thank you. I think I'm the only one left now to talk about Gen A. Okay. <laughs> so I think, you know, uh, before really going to the Gen A part, uh, just a uh, experience that happened just some minutes back, you might have observed that I was sweating, right? So even if we can introduce AI, ML and Gen A to the civil engineering <laughs> part, we still need the human intelligence to be there in place, right? So because of this curvature in the sitting arrangement, uh, I happened to miss the, the cool breeze. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I was sweating in the beginning but thanks to the one who actually observed it, so hats off to human intelligence. So we need definitely the human intelligence to really uh, you know, manage the, the 
uh, the overall computer intelligence as well. But you know, I'll, I'll just uh, start with the, the saying you know, that uh, there was a time when we used to see that automation and testing uh, is behind from the overall innovation that is happening on the development side. Right? The, the developers used to always have the additional uh, you know, respect in terms of you know, their profiling and, and everything. But I believe you know, with Gen AI coming into picture, we see an uh, advantage here. Because uh, now with Gen AI in place, we are talking about uh, generating the code and low code, no code platform when uh, no one is writing the code in place. But just imagine 10 years back, automation industry was already talking about uh, no scripting platforms of automation, right? So I think we kind of won that game quite early on, uh, you know, uh, from the development community because uh, testing community already started thinking that how we can ease the experience for the practitioner itself because they are the end users. If they have to spend uh, days and nights and months and uh, you know uh, evenings and weekends in developing the frameworks, and then at the end the testing is happening at a quite late stage, how we can shift that mindset uh, from a scripting-based automation to a low-code, no-code-based platforms, uh, and it started coming to the market quite early on. And I was hearing ServiceNow is coming up with something wherein uh, they are having some features placed uh, in the app itself, which can help uh, the the users to create workflows. But just talking about a couple of things where we are investing right now. I think you brought a very fair point that uh, to deal with Gen A, we need to have the right questions. So our parents used to say that, you know, there is no wrong question. But I think that is changing now, right? So if we have to really deal with Gen A, we need to have the right context and right question in place because if you'll keep on asking the wrong questions, you'll get uh, the wrong answers as well. Right? So you have to really train yourself that you have the right context given to the Gen A. And with that mindset in place, what we are coming with one of our products is that we are coming with a uh, testing assistant for the testers, wherein uh, if they want to create a functional test case for, let us say, a login uh, screen or login, you know, a workflow, uh, this assistant will prompt them with the right questions as well, because the tester might not be having the right prompt available. That what should I ask so that I can get the right answer? So this is one thing which we are coming up with. We are coming with a speech to uh, code uh, generation uh, functionality as well wherein uh, the user would be able to say that I want to solve this use case, I want to convert this into a test case and uh, you'd be able to generate the, the test case out of it, you know, which is more of a executable test case as well. Pretty much the same, uh, you know, where the entire industry is going. But I think from a test automation perspective or testing perspective, we have to identify those pockets of uh, experiences which would be more relevant from an experience perspective so that we can start investing in the direction. So I would say it's a time of observation and a trend setting for us because we are into that zone where in innovation have uh, uh, given us the, the possibilities in place. But now we need to see where we can fit those possibilities for the user so that it uh, really gives that benefit to the wider audience. That will be my take on this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Saurabh, you want to share on how AI is impacting digital experience or where organization should invest in digital or how AI can play a role in digital experience? I believe there are three factors that a certain organization can at the moment you know, uh, invest in in that case. Uh, first of all, it could be maybe related to hiring top talents. Not really top talents, but training the talents to get into a top arena of… You know, sustainable talent. Sustainable. That, that's a good word. I know I've barely come across it. That's a good word. Uh, sustainable talents in that case. And the second one is cloud infrastructure. Right. You, you know, you left ship your entire testing infrastructure to either, you know, on-prem to cloud to get into the whole testing phase, right? Testing becomes very easier when it comes to your whole infrastructure when it's on a certain cloud, right? And then you, you'll be able to seamlessly test entire infrastructure, get the whole arena of what is happening inside your applications, inside your games, inside your whole network and device, and then get insights into how you can improve your end, end touch points, digital touch points. And the third one would be, uh, in that case, empathy or, or just realizing for a fact that, okay, this is where Gen AI might disrupt, this is, an, this, this is where Gen AI might not disrupt, this is where we might have to work on, or this is where we might have to not work on, this will be taken care of at the end of the day. Right? I'll keep this short, but that's the three things I would summarize into. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think we had a very good conversation on how quality engineering 2.0 is going to shape right, right from end-to-end -end automation, intelligent automation, digital experience, right, data management, generative AI. I think a lot of things uh, coming in, coming two, three years, right? So a lot of things to look upon. Yeah, thank you all for having an insightful discussion. Uh,